So. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, David, for inviting me. Uh, I wanted to explain a little bit about the background and conclusions of the report which we published at the end of October on the economics of climate change. It's about the economics of climate change, let me, let me stress. I've had a lifetime academically and in international institutions working on the economics of policy, and what we try to do here is to bring the economics of policy to bear on the problem of climate change. Now, the conclusions that we came to were the following. First, that um, the costs of action, around 1% or so of GDP as a world, are much less than the costs of inaction. The costs of inaction uh, have to do with the risks which we put ourselves in from doing very little about climate change. If we go on with business as usual for a century or so, we will start to um, move into territory which is incredibly risky. We will, if we go on as business as usual, move to something over 800 parts per million of CO2 equivalent of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere sometime around the turn of the century. That would give us at least a 50% probability, at least a 50% of probability, of ending up at, at least five degrees centigrade above where we were in pre-industrial times. That is an enormous change. Um, five degrees centigrade lower than where we are now, for example, um, Canada would have been under probably a mile or so of ice. It wouldn't really exist. These are the kinds of transformations that we risk if we go on under business as usual. Not a remote risk, actually a remote risk would be bad enough, uh, but a serious risk in terms of over 50% probability. So you look at the kinds of costs associated with those kinds of temperature increases. It's difficult to do, obviously, very formally or precisely because you're looking a long way ahead. But most reasonable assessments of the costs of inaction, moving to the kind of uh, territory that I described, most reasonable estimates of those costs would, in my view, come to the conclusion that the costs of inaction are far greater than the costs of action. If you're talking about growth, the growth strategy is to um, go on to a low carbon economy as a world. Uh, the other strategy of ignoring this issue is eventually anti-growth. So that's the first and important conclusion of the report. Secondly, is that the climate is going to change. It's going to change because of what we've already done and uh, because of the time it will take us to move to a low carbon economy. So there's a lot of change that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, London, for example, is going to have to face uh, wetter winters and drier summers. That will put a lot of pressure on uh, the London sewage system. Um, every part of the world will, be, um, will, will, will have to change as a result of the climate change which will occur even if we act sensibly. So the challenge of adaptation, building our infrastructure to um, withstand much stronger pressures of storms and droughts and floods and sea level rise, looking for agriculture that's better adapted to climate change. Um, in developing countries, time to think through what this means for uh, irrigation systems in a world where the climate is changing. These are the kinds of things that we're going to have to deal with. So the second conclusion of the report was we're going to have to invest quite a lot of adapt in adaptation anyway, and we'd better think through um, how the climate is going to change region by region so that we better understand those adaptations that are going to be necessary. Of course, adapting to two or three degrees centigrade increase would be pretty tough, uh, but it, it's uh, completely different, another ball game entirely, from trying to adapt to five or six degrees. The only way of doing that would be to, uh, um, essentially, you'd have to deal with whole-scale movements of population, large parts of the world becoming essentially uh, uninhabitable. And that, of course, is very likely to lead to, to conflict. So, first story, cost of action less than the cost of inaction. Second story, we're going to uh, have to adapt, even though, as we all hope, we do manage to behave much more responsibly relative to the climate than in the past. Third conclusion is that uh, we have to examine the kinds of economic policy uh, measures that are going to be necessary as a world to enable us to adapt. Well, the first thing is to look at the scale of the problem. Uh, if we're to reduce the kind of risks in the way that I described and David Suzuki was referring to, we have to at least 
reduce the overall emissions flows by 2050 as a world by around 30% or so relative to where we are now. Absolutely, 30% reductions. And we have to set ourselves on a path as a world from now on that's consistent with doing that. So given that that's an objective for 2050, which uh, is um, probably the minimum that we should do from the point of view of the economics of risk, we have to start now because we're going to see a lot of economic growth between now and then, a lot of parts of the world growing between now and then. So it's absolutely crucial that we move strongly. Otherwise, we'll be starting to build up concentrations in the atmosphere, which will be difficult to cope with. So clear medium-term targets and uh, early action. The rich countries should, uh, you know, from the basic equity point of view of who put the greenhouse gases up, where, up there, and the fact, of course, that they're richer, and the fact that they're still emitting the majority, they should take stronger um, ambitions, and we suggest in the report the ambitions for rich countries by 2050 should be 60 to 80 percent reductions. California has 80 percent, France 75 percent, UK over 60 percent. That's starting to happen. That's the first thing, be clear about where you want to go. Second is use uh, economic incentives. Um, people do respond to prices. I spent my lifetime as an economist, and you who've lived and uh, spent money uh, don't need me to tell you that. Uh, price incentives affect what people do. Um, that means we need a price for carbon, uh, either a tax or a trading system, or implicitly through regulation. Research and development in energy in the world has halved over the last 25 years. Halved when I mean, it should have been going the other way. We have to send that right back the other way, and we argue for another at least $10 billion per annum. A small in relation to the other things we do, but significant in relation to what could be done uh, on uh, energy research. So get the price, get the price signals right, uh, push forward with the research, development, and deployment, and then take on uh, some of the other issues uh, like uh, energy efficiency, deforestation, and, and so on, which would enable us as a world to move uh, quickly. So we understand, I think, the economics of risk and just how risky our current path is. We can see the kinds of directions where we need to adapt, although we have to study that much more carefully, and we see the economic tools which uh, are necessary to take us there. Now the challenge is to build the international coalition for action. Uh, Canada, as a, as a member of the G8, is um, a very influential country in the world, I think will be very important in building that international coalition for action. Because this is an international problem. It has to be solved country by country, taking decisions on its own, but thinking through how best to collaborate and work with others. Thank you. So I guess we can open the floor.